Um, welcome okay. everyone to our, our Cervical Cancer Awareness Month program. Um, today's topic is beyond cervical cancer. I'm talking about different HPV related um, cancers for men and women. We are so appreciative of all of you for joining us today, whether you're on Zoom with us or on Facebook Live. Um, my name is Aliyah Poulos and I work in the UChicago Cancer Center's Office of Cancer Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. Um, and we're joined by, by our director, Ms. Gina Curry, who's also on. There she goes, she just waved. Thanks, Gina. Um, and so uh, we have two faculty physicians who are gonna be speaking today, Dr. Elizabeth Blair and Dr. Uh, ben Shogan. And Dr. Blair, in the interest of time, I'm gonna throw it to you and you can go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. This is a great day, I got my pearls on for everybody who likes symbols. Mm -hmm. um, we are, um, and I'm running up to the hour, oh, I don't care who chastises me. Um, so uh, today we're talking about uh, other implications of, uh, of uh, HPV cancer. And um, I'm an otolaryngologist, head neck surgeon. And so um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, HPV related oral pharyngeal cancer, what you need to know about the diagnosis, treatment, and uh, management of it, okay? And um, some of this is, um, I, I believe the American Head and Neck Society, and then some of the data, and, and some of the data comes from the American Cancer Society. So here we go. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about the trends in the epidemiology or of HPV related um, oral pharyngeal cancer, oral pharynx is, behind the oral cavity, so it's the tonsils, adenoid to the base of the tongue. It's, when you look back at your mouth, you know, the part where the uvula hangs down, and it's part of what you see um, uh, just behind there, okay? And we'll talk about how these um, cancers present and approaches to diagnosis and treatment, some treatment options, and then a little bit briefly on the indications for HPV uh, vaccination. Um, and so uh, let me just say that, um, you know, traditionally um, these are cancers of the head and neck are associated with uh, tobacco use and alcohol use. Uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? Raise your hand if you can hear. Okay. I, I just I hear you. And I want to like halfway through find out. It's garbled. Um, and so, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a head and neck surgeon, when I started out, um, the overall survival five years was about 40% all comers. Um, and, uh, you know, there were big movements to reduce smoking and smoking cessation programs uh, because of the, its impact on uh, cancer. And in the time period I've been practicing, I've been here for 20 years, I've been practicing for about 30. Um, we've seen the incidence of smoking in this country go down, right? We don't have smoking lounges, we don't smoke on the airplanes. And we're seeing in some cases, smoking related tumors go down. But uh, unfortunately, um, in um, my senior years here, I'm not doing as much what we uh, of other types of you know skin cancers and things like that because uh, there's been an uptake in um, head and neck cancer, um, and it's one of the few that has uh, been increasing, and a lot of that is due to the uh, HPV virus, the human papilloma virus, um, and so people used to um, you know there's a tendency sometimes for people to want to blame patients for their cancer. Oh, well, if you didn't smoke, you wouldn't have this. Um, but, uh, and so there was always, even though we've had many people who never smoked get cancer, um, you know, there's been sort of a scarlet S about it, right? Oh. Um, and so we've moved from the scarlet S of smoking to the scarlet X, S of, of, of uh, sex. And um, because uh, HPV is predominantly uh, thought to be a sexually transmitted virus and uh, that's how um, uh, people get um, cervical cancer is um, that's the transmission mechanism. And, uh, you know, they figured this out by like looking at studies of, let's say, uh, uh, groups of nuns um, and the um, association in cervical cancer certainly is, you know, uh, early onset of sexual activity as well as uh, increasing numbers of, of different partners increase your risk. Um, and so, uh, to be honest, though, Michael Douglas probably got his also from smoking cigars. Um, maybe he got had two causes, but but in in general, um, that's sort of what we're seeing today, and that's 
uh, you know, the changes in social activities of Americans are changing uh, the distribution of this. And so uh, uh, oral pharyngeal, the incidence of oral pharyngeal cancer is, uh, I think it has surpassed cervical cancer um, when you look at in, in the US. Um, and this is certainly the incidence in different countries has to do with um, uh, this, how the society functions. But here you see on the left in calendar years, 1991 and 92, and then 2003, 2004. And you look at all the overall number of cancers in the oral pharynx, the tonsil and base of tongue. And we see that it's actually increasing and that um, the ones that are negative and HPV negative, so probably smoking or other causes is decreased. Um, but we've seen an uptick in um, oral HPV positive cancers. Um, here we see um, uh, when we look at calendar years, the comparison to cervical can overall oral pharynx cancers, the oral pharynx cancers, this is overall, this is in men. And, uh, you know, we're pretty close. If I know we haven't surpassed uh, the number of men with pharynx cancer from HPV may be greater than the uh, number of uh, women who get cervical cancer. And, and some of that is... Um, uh, not totally well understood, um, but we do know that for the when the vaccines came out, they were um, uh, really designed and the indications were for young women, uh, for adolescents um, to prevent um, uh, cervical cancers. They were not, uh, boys were not eligible to get it. And uh, it um, also appears, you know, when we know that lots, uh, there isn't a woman around who hasn't um, been probably to a gynecologist and had a pap smear, which is looking for cervical cancer. Um, so there's screening mechanisms for it. And in and oral pharynx cancer, we don't have clear screening mechanisms. So um, it usually doesn't present until the patient has uh, frank cancer. And we don't have any preventions for it. And so then this is um, the pink line here is cervical cancers again decreasing. And this is the, the estimate going forward. And we see HPV positive oral pharynx cancers and then the one in men is the red line. Um, and so uh, uh, it's, it's changed. Uh, is, there a, a, is there a question? Does someone have a question? Okay, maybe that's just for me. All right. Um, and so when we look at the number of, um, sorry, when we look at the number of uh, HPV uh, types uh, related cancers, um, by, sorry, when we look at the HPV cancers um, by site and by sex, this is the total number of HPV related cancers. And uh, the uh, blue is oral pharynx, uh, the red is uh, anal, the green is cervix, the purple is vaginal, uh, the um, kind of teal turquoise color is uh, uh, vulva and uh, the uh, orange yellow is uh, penile. And um, so this is total numbers and uh, these are the National Cancer Institute uh, from 2013. And we see that the um, number overall uh, is greater than the cervical alone in men. It's the most common uh, HPV related cancer. Um, women still have um, uh, a high incidence of cervical cancer um, but uh, as the population ages and the, and the pervasiveness of uh, vaccinated women increase, um, we should see some of that go down. And so um, it's kind of one of these things people don't understand. And this is looking at SEER data and the uh, incidence uh, by age per 100,000 people of uh, uh, oral pharynx cancer. And it has continued to uptick uh, over the past 15 years um, when most of the other sites are going down. And it's predominantly um, in men um, and it is being seen instead of a disease where we just see people in their 60s and 70s getting out, we're seeing people in their 30s, um, 40s and 50s. So it's a younger cohort of patients. Um, here. Um, and as HPV, it seems to you know infect either the, the the lining of the skin or the mucous membranes. Um, 
you know, when you look at uh, sexually, uh, when you look at all um, uh, um, genital swabs for Americans, you see anywhere from 23 to 62% of the swabs harbor HPV. Um, and as uh, time has marched along, uh, the uh, percentage of sexually active uh, American adults, uh, that number has gone up. And the thing is, just because you have been exposed to it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have genital warts or that you're going to harbor HPV or that you're going to be at risk for cervical cancer. Many, many people clear the infection. In fact, um, in the pharynx, it's thought that uh, women, for some reason, uh, maybe um, inoculation uh, in the vagina, uh, they clear the infection um, and uh, men don't. And so you see these uh, changes that happen that lead to viral prolifer proliferation, um, but not necessarily car carcinogenesis. And uh, there are some subtypes of, um, uh, there are some subtypes uh, that are certainly more oncogenic. And those have been the subtypes that have been uh, targeted in the uh, various uh, uh, vaccines that are out. Um, uh, so it doesn't necessarily cover all HPV, but it covers predominantly the ones that are uh, felt to have a high incidence of carcinogenesis. And so this cancers occur in the back of the throat. So at the base of the tongue um, and in the tonsils and the posterior pharyngeal wall. So really when you look in the mouth, the tongue, the cheeks and the rough of the mouth are all considered oral cavity. The soft palate and the uvula, the tonsils and the way back of the tongue are all considered um, to be oral pharynx. And so they're not actually areas that are that easy to see. Um, there are, again, uh, at least 40 types of uh, uh, HPV. They can cause benign and malignant disease. And the majority are asymptomatic and people clear in about two years. Um, and it's these 10% of those that persist that are of the more aggressive subtypes that uh, lead to uh, cancer. Um, it is the most sexually transmitted um, infection. Um, and it is the uh, most common um, uh, virally, vi uh, virally related to cancer that we see. They think that at least 25% of the US population has uh, been exposed or um, uh, infected with some strain of HPV, which is you know a huge amount. Um, and again, uh, the same strains that you see in the genital tract um, can infect the oral pharynx. And most of these uh, oral infections are asymptomatic. It's not an area that's easy to examine. And we don't have any good screening like um, pap smears uh, for the area. And so usually, unless someone has a visible wart or they develop a cancer, um, it's hard to uh, determine it. Um, and the acquisition of oral, um, an oral pharyngeal HPV is associated with oral genital contact. And then again, just like in the, in the GYN tract, uh, the risk increases the number of oral sex partners and uh, the uh, number of oral sex acts and certainly the earlier uh, the onset of activity. Um, we think that um, persistence of the infection, which leads to cancer, is um, most associated with um, sometimes with sexual behavior and local immunity, but uh, the, the data supports strongly uh, additional uh, impact of smoking. Uh, it's more common in men and uh, uh, increases in, in uh, as, as patients age. Um, let me see, go back. And the persistent infection sort of smoldering there is considered a risk factor for cancer development. But again, we currently don't have any tests to screen for that. Um, uh, again, the prevalence in the U.S. is about 12% um, and is gradually increasing every year, which is 11 million men and 3.2 million women. Um, and more uh, than half of these are caused by um, type 16. And men have a six-fold higher incidence of type 16 women. And that's not really well understood unless, because you know, they haven't been able to stratify it out for like the people who've been vaccinated versus the people who have not been vaccinated, but they, they, those survey studies don't uh, link to that. Um, uh, way that it presents, because um, people are always like, well, how would you know? Um, is It's common that we see a man with really no pain and no symptoms who gets a lump, notices a lump when shaving. 
He feels great, no fever, no changes in his weight, no changes in his voice, no difficulty swallowing, never a smoker. You know, he thinks maybe he's had like a recent cold or an infection and uh, feels this lump in his neck, um, sees his primary, he gets a couple courses of antibiotics that don't work and eventually gets a CAT scan which shows an enlarged lymph node and may or may not show changes in the back of the throat um, that are not visible really from like the front with a flashlight. Um, and they get referred uh, usually to an olaryngologist. Sometimes they just get a needle aspiration in the office uh, if they see some uh, of an oncologist and that's how they get the diagnosis. Um, you know, and the history can really be not very exciting. Some of these patients have been uh, married and monogamous for 20 or 30 years. So, you know, those kinds of questions come up. Um, and, uh, but the diagnosis is, and, and it can be from, you know, uh, it can sort of, the risk behavior can be from many years uh, in the past. Um, and uh, the biopsy of the, the neck of the primary confirms the diagnosis. Um, we do uh, testing of these to see if they're um, either P16 or uh, HPV positive, if it's P16 negative, and um, we stage them. Um, the staging tends to um, be better for this than for people who have the same site of cancer that is not um, related to HPV, um, and they seem to be uh, more responsive to treatment, but 20% of patients who get HPV-related oral pharynx cancer will die of their disease. So it's not 60%, like, but it's 20%, it's still a significant number because these are young, um, active people. Um, sometimes they are, we can figure out that it's a, palate, a, a tonsil or a lingual tonsil based the tongue primary site, sometimes the primary can be very tiny. Um, and most of the time, the present in sign is um, lumps in the neck or uh, nodal disease. Um, we've seen a, uh, we've seen a uh, great response. Um, these are usually exquisitely sensitive to radiation and chemo radiation therapy. Um, and but uh, in some cases for smaller volume disease, uh, surgery is uh, the first line. Um, but uh, regardless of the treatment, you can just see that this is a, a radiation field involving the back of the tongue and the tonsils and the pharynx and getting treatment to this area will have a, a lifelong impact on swallowing, voice, dry throat um, and hoarseness. So um, even though it can be successfully treated, there are um, consequences of that treatment. Um, I think it's important to know that oral HPV is not something that's casually transmitted by sharing drinks or kissing on the cheek. Um, mess, by the time people find out about this, they've usually kind of already shared um, any kind of, you know, uh, infections or microbiome. Um, and, you know, it's important if someone knows that they have HPV to talk about various protection methods such as barrier and, and condoms. Just because someone's um, exposed to HPV doesn't mean they're gonna get cancer. Um, and I don't actually have that. I, I, I have most of the patients where the partners both get a throat cancer, it's because they smoked a lot together. It's not usually uh, been, there have been some associations where the, the lifelong partner, a married partner, uh, one has cervical, uh, high risk cervical disease and, and the partner has it's oral pharynx cancer, but um, that's not the case that often. It's, it's in my experience, I haven't seen it very, I, I, I have not seen it. Um, the rate of HPV, oral HPV among partners is the same. If, if someone has a GYN uh, HPV, the rate among their partners is the same as among the general population. They don't have an increased risk. Um, and patients, uh, partners of patients with HPV had neck cancer could have slightly higher rates of HPV related um, other cancers, but they remain rare. And they overall, the chance is low, um, but it appears that um, it uh, is, it's, a, it's, it's, it's going up. And so we need to think about what to do about it. Um, there's no readily available screening. Um, and, you know, this is uh, where we really think about the importance of vaccination. It, um, we know that the vaccination for HPV prevents uh, infection, pre-malignancy, and cancer. Um, and uh, 
There is now we're starting to see data that supports this uh, for oral pharynx cancer. Um, it we're not sure how much immunity it uh, gives to people who already have certain strains, but it can prevent you from other strains and reduce the burden of infection um, on a population level, which I think is important. Uh, the uh, vaccine efficacy with the rates of HPV infection targeted by the vaccine fell um, in, uh, from 11.5% in 03 to 06 uh, to 5.1% in 07 to 2010. And that's, uh, they found it was effective. You get increase, uh, the original uh, uh, injection series, it was three vaccines and, uh, you know, certainly lots of people only got one or two, um, but even uh, one, one shot uh, gives uh, some immunity. Um, and they, after 79 million doses of Gardasil distributed since 2006, the incidence of <clears throat> serious adverse effects is a less than 0.1%, which is encouraging. Um, and they uh, look at um, people given either HPV 16, 18 vaccine or HEP A, they found that 93% um, um, vaccine efficacy. Um, and the problem is, so they can test to see uh, if you get it, but you know it's hard to get an immune response and the impact on whether it prevents cancer takes a long time from the vaccine to actually uh, manifestation of uh, malignancy. So. Uh, it's uh, some of these studies, the data is still being acquired because there's such a long latency between exposure and when a patient uh, actually has maybe a, a chronic infection that's not really doing anything and then uh, becomes malignancy. Um, in 2015, only 63% of girls had received one dose and only 42% had received all doses and 50% of boys had one dose and 28% have received all three doses. Um, so primary reason is it's not uh, recommended by their doctors. And I think the reason we don't see all the doses is that um, you know, the recommendation is starting about 12 or 13. And that age, it, you know, when your kids are under 12, it's a lot easier to manage them going to uh, the pediatrician and getting their immunizations and their certain uh, benchmarks for getting your shots in elementary schools. Um, usually there's one in high school and then if they're gonna go to college. And so it, uh, when you don't have these mandatory things, like it's a pain to get into the pediatrician for most of us. So this is I think where we fall down on getting um, all of the uh, doses in the series. Uh, now they've uh, changed some of the vaccine recommendations. So it's recommended for all girls and boys up to age 26. And in certain settings, people with potential risk factors um, uh, up to the age of 45. Um, and the, the goal is to immunize prior to infection um, and it is efficacious in preventing infection. Um, it uh, doesn't seem to be as effective against strains you already have, but could doesn't mean you couldn't get other strains. And so that's the purpose of it. Um, the uh, utilization is poor, but improving um, and education is certainly needed for both parents, pediatricians, primary care providers, children and, and young adults. Um, and that is it. So I um, I think I have a few moments for if there's any questions in the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Blair. If anyone has any questions, they can just unmute themselves and ask, or if they um, feel better typing it into the chat, if they wanna do it anonymously, that's, um, that is fine too. I'm just going to check on our Facebook Live to see if there are any comments there. It's great to see we have um, 41 participants. That's really very awesome. It's very... Um, oh, yeah. We have an amazing group that we have coming to these, these sessions. Thanks everyone again for, for being here. Um, so I, I don't see any questions in the chat and I don't see any questions um, in, our, in our Facebook comments. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, so Dr. I, I have Blair, a quick question. Oh, there you go. I'm I sure, have a quick Kirk. question. And I uh, and thank you so much. And, and as Aaliyah said, I, this group is phenomenal. They always support us. We didn't know because of the inauguration if we were going to, you know, have a big turnout, but we did have a big turnout. So thank you so much for supporting. Thank you so much for your presentation. So because Aaliyah and I are always in the community and you may have mentioned this. So I apologize if I'm asking a question that you went over. A lot of times in the community, um, we uh, we talk about disparities and that kind of thing mm -hmm. for this kind of cancer. And one of the things our LBGTQ plus um, uh, uh, constituents ask about this a lot. Do you see any disparities with that group or any other group in particular? Well, I, I think that, you know, as as everybody's aware, I mean, there are, you know, I, the disparities come from a bunch of things. One is some some different groups in the community may be more um, res resistant or suspicious of, of shots. And, you know, you get the ones that are mandatory because you got to put your kids in school, uh, even if, you know, you may not be that psyched about it. Um, and so, um, you know, access to healthcare is harder when you work, you have a day job or a night job or both jobs, okay? And then, you know, there's these, I mean, they can tell you how you want about the copay not being very much, but copays, you know, just increase barriers, right? To um, healthcare for some patients and getting off work, getting your kid there and getting him to do things. So like, you know, I think that when the state has rules for school, like we all know that like this year, like all immunizations are down because pediatricians offices were closed. We're not allowed to leave the house. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's been challenging on multiple areas. And um, I think I'm not, so the problem is while recommended, uh, the HPV is not um, mandated, is not one of the mandated uh, vaccinations. And so you know, people are sometimes unwilling. They just want to do the minimum. They, they don't like needles. They hurt it hurts the arm. And so, um, you know, they don't want to fight with their kids or they pick what they fight about with their kids. And so it's, um, those are challenges, I think, for all parents. Um, but I think that, you know, people on limited incomes and, you know, not all of the family medicine and pediatri pediatric offices may have, you know, all of these uh, what are considered maybe optional vaccines, right? I don't know, but that can be a problem. Um, and so, uh, and, and again, like I, I have kids, so I know that like going into high school, I had to get like one more batch of everything. And then when my oldest one went to college, you know, you had to get like the meningitis, you had to make, you had to prove that you had some stuff done. But in between, unless they play sports, the sports physical, they don't, you know, they only cover the mandatory vaccines. And so then things like HPV never come up. And so um, uh, I think there, um, I think that that is going to in particular impact certain communities um, who have maybe more limited resources and more limited care. And unfortunately that places them, at, they're already at increased risk to get malignancy, right? Because just, that's what the data shows. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I have a 12 year old and she had her first HPV vaccination and then they canceled the second one um, when COVID hit. So you yeah. can still get it because I missed my second one with one of my kids and we just got it a year later. We they just, you know, they didn't have to repeat the first one. They just gave it like later the on. Later day. Yeah. yeah. We missed it for I, I maybe that either me or the pediatrician had a conflict. So so it happens, but you know, I, I mean, if we want to save our kids from suffering, and if you can save your child from like having a cancer, like absolutely bigger than saving them from having chickenpox, and we, you know, I, I think that um, some of this has all gotten swept up, and I do think that the um, arm pain, like they, bit, the kids all complain about it. So, you know, what we say to our at our house, wah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm well, not well. the mouth. I have boys, and so can you know, imagine you can't be that sympathetic. But uh, <laughs> you're a good I have a question here in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Go ahead. I have a, a question here in the chat. It says, I don't think I've ever been vaccinated for HPV. Is there an upper limit where a person should not worry about getting a vaccination? So um, it's currently um, easily gotten by the age of 26. And uh, the CDC says there are circumstances, you know, that then, you know, you should ask your physician. They will give it now up to people up to 45 and particularly certain, you know, so if you're sexually active, if you have cervical dysplasia already, not to prevent that, but to actually, you know, prevent you from perhaps being impacted by other strains of HPV, just because you have one doesn't mean you have seen all of them. It's shocking, right? And um, it took a while for that to uh, people to start to be rational about it. Um, and uh, they don't seem to see an effect in uh, people over 45. And when you look at the population, you know, uh, people over 50, you know, um, had a different, you know, society and social mores and sexual activity have changed in the past, let's say, 50 years. And just like my kids say, I don't know what it's like. Well, maybe I don't, but maybe I don't. It probably has changed some. And um, so there is more sexual activity and there is, um, you know, more risk. We know that. Uh, but you can ask your, your physician. Thank you for that. That's really helpful information. Um, there was another question asking about um, vaccine resistance, but I think that you, um, you addressed that. Um, okay, any, any other questions before, uh, before Dr. Blair dashes off to surgery and we thank her again for making time oh. for us? Um, I, I, you know, it's a little bit like um, as a mom, I'm all about preventing emergencies. And I would, I think it's so much easier to prevent anything than it is to try to take care of it once it happens, right? You know, put the lid on the milk as opposed to trying to mop it up off the floor. And so you know, I kind of approach vaccination in a similar way. And, um, you know, that's a whole nother topic, but this is one of those things that, you know, predominantly affects women and now we're seeing it affect men. And I, I think, you know, maybe that's where we'll see, you know, more public health uh, interest and dollars go to really uh, 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 facing this head on. It's unfortunate, but without showing changes, like it's hard to get um, people behind you on this. Absolutely, we see that in HPV vaccine, COVID vaccine, the whole thing. So, so thanks so much for, again, for coming today and sharing your expertise. Um, and so now we are going to uh, throw it to Dr. Ben Shogan, um, and you are a co-host, Dr. Shogan, so you should be able to share your screen when you're ready. Okay, perfect. Let me uh, do that. There we go. Is that working? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you again for the... Uh, for the invite to come. I did this last year. I think this is a great program and a great um, a, a great group. It's actually a lot bigger this year than it was last year. I guess that's that's good for Zoom, I suppose. Um, so I'm a colorectal surgeon um, and I'm gonna spend probably another 10 or 15 minutes. There'll be some overlap with Dr. Blair's talk, but I think that's okay. Just talking about HPV disease for men and women, um, anal cancer, as well as condyloma and uh, you know, while we think of HPV as for cervical cancer in women, um, or like Dr. Blair said, and oral pharyngeal cancer, um, it, 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 there's a lot of effect it can have in the anal canal, which I'll, which I'll talk about. Um, so this was talked about a bit, but just as a summary, um, the human papillomavirus is a DNA type virus. Um, and like Dr. Blair alluded to, there's many, many different strains um, of HPV, um, it's sort of like there's many, many different strains of human. That's what I have here. Um, some of those strains are very high risk for cancer um, when you get infected with them. Some are very low risk, um, but they often travel together. So you can't really, you can't really tell. Some of those strains um, cause anal warts or condyloma we'll talk about, some don't, um, but they co-mingle with each other. So that's an important, um, that's an important part as 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 you uh, as we think about this going forward, 
And, you know, unfortunately, we're the only species that gets it. This only infects humans. So your, your pets and animals won't be uh, getting HPV. Um, ju just a little background about the area of the body that we're talking about. Um, it's only about a, you know, one or two inch area, but I think it's important to have everyone on the same, on the same side, on the same page. This is the anal canal. This is like where the stool comes out. And the anal canal starts um, right where the stool comes out for about um, two inches on the inside. You can see it there. So if you were, again, this is a little bit uh, visual, um, but if you were to bend over, um, the, the first two inches or so is the anal canal. The anal margin is the area um, that is right outside the anal canal. The way that we teach it to my, my residents, my medical students, is if you put a saucer on your bottom, that kind of circle around the anus um, or your bottom is what the anal margin is called. And both of these areas can be infected with HPV, but how we treat them is complete, can be completely differently. So just to, just to put everyone on the same page there. We're really only talking about the last inch or two of the anus. And when we talk about anal cancer, it's completely different than rectal cancer or colon cancer, those uh, cancers are caused by, they're not caused by HPV. Um, anal cancer is specifically an HPV induced um, cancer. Um, so that's also very important. So like I said, HPV can cause condyloma or warts um, as well as anal cancer. And the, um, th this was also spoken about uh, in Dr. Blair's talk, which I'll just go, um, I just go through fast is that um, HPV almost always is transmitted by sexual contact. 75% um, of all sexual active adults have at least one anal genital HPV strain um, and that warts do not have to be present for transmission. And another, um, another important part of this is that it doesn't have to involve anal sex or any type of, um, any type of anal sexual intercourse. Um, the front part is very, very close to the back part. So when I see patients um, that are getting diagnosed with anal cancer or anal condyloma, the first thing they say is, hey, I don't have anal sex ever. And I say, it doesn't really make a difference. Patients can have um, really any type of oral or any type of sexual intercourse and still get infected in that anus area. And the reason is, is because it's very close um, to the front. So there just has to be some type of contact, um, get an infection that virus will invade through that abrasion in the skin, um, and then it can lay latent, so you never see it, and then develop symptoms later. Very similar to cervical cancer or oral pharyngeal cancer. So the first thing you can cause is anal warts, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is the anal margin. Um, this is the area around the anus. It looks like sort of, we describe it as cauliflower. This is kind of a very typical case. Sometimes we see it with just, you know, one or two little lesions, but this is kind of a moderate amount. This is actually a colonoscopy. This, so this is on the inside. Sometimes patients think it's a hemorrhoid. So it's, it's common for them for to say, hey, doctor, I have something coming in and out. I must have hemorrhoids. And you take a look and it's not a hemorrhoid, but it's anal condylum on the inside. And this is obviously a very, very severe case in a patient has very, very severe condyloma. This is kind of one end of the spectrum. Um, it's very, very common. Um, prevalence is one to 5%. It's most common in young adults. Um, again, it's only caused by these low risk strains, um, six and 11. Um, but importantly, this co-infection with other strains is very common. So even though these low risk strains that's causing this condyloma doesn't cause cancer, um, there's no way to tell if there's another one, a strain that is around there that is, has a potential to cause cancer. This could just be a harbinger of that. Um, patients who get anal warts are commonly associated with immunosuppression. Um, so this can be patients either who are transplant patients, patients who are on HIV, uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease patients can get it because they're on immunosuppression. Um, but it certainly can be seen in anybody as well. It doesn't have to only be patients um, here immunosuppressed. After the initial appearance, lesions can sometimes regress spontaneously. Think of that as just like a wart on your finger that just goes away. Um, one third of lesions do regress without treatment. 
but another two thirds of lesions or so um, will not go away. And at that point, the, the, the patient will usually seek some type of uh, treatment for that. What we do in the, um, in the office when I get referred to a patient or any of my colleagues get referred to a patient is to do a physical exam. Um, yes, this does involve looking in that area. It's, it's, it's so common when, when the patient comes in and, and says, hey, I have something on my bottom. I say, well, can we look at it? And he's like, oh, I thought you were going to look at it. Or I didn't know you were going to look at it. Like, of, of course we have to. Um, it's, it is a little bit invasive, but it's not painful. We completely respect the idea that it is an uncomfortable exam, um, but um, we do everything we can to make it as as easy um, and as least invasive as possible. Um, we usually have to use a small little scope that only goes in about an inch or so. And we take a look at the canal as well as the outside of the, of the anus. Um, if it is um, diagnosed, usually, especially if it's the first time, we'll test for other SCDs because we do know that SCDs will live together and, and be prepared for that. Um, the treatment um, is first of all is reassurance. Um, especially patients who are diagnosed with this the first time, um, you know, they, there's a bad stigma around anal warts and we just reassure them that it is very, very common, um, that we see it all the time, that we probably, it's probably more common than we even see, and it is something that can be treated. We oftentimes will start with medical therapy. This is just an ointment, which I have listed there. Um, Aldera might be one that is probably the most commonly uh, trade named uh, medication. And these are placed on the anus a couple times a day for a couple months. And in most cases, if it's not that bad, um, it, will, it will take care of it. Um, and you won't need any further treatment. If, <clears throat> if it does not um, resolve with topical treatment, then usually the next step is some type of surgical therapy. Uh, we, we, we do this in colorectal. Uh, dermatology has other ways to do it as well. But what we do is we often take the patient to the operating room for a procedure just under some sedation. And we either burn it off, which is what this thing does. It's called a bovis, so what we use in the OR uh, to just burn off these lesions. Again, just like burning off a war on your finger. Um, you can use a laser to do that. You can do something called cryoablation, which is just freezing it off. Um, and then when for the bigger lesions, we can excise them. So if you can imagine this being there, you can excise it and it leaves a little bit of an opening, but it heals, it heals up just fine. Um, these are outpatient procedures. There's really minimal pain associated with them, um, unless in the really dramatic instances. Um, and patients will go home and get pretty good um, pretty good re release from this. They'll come back to the office a month or two later, um, be examined again to make sure that there isn't any residual disease. And if there isn't, then, then in essence, they'll, they'll go on their way. Sometimes um, when there is a lot of disease, we might have to do this a couple of times uh, to take care of the lesions, but eventually we will be able to get a, get a hold of it. Anal cancer. So this is, you know, whereas anal condyloma isn't life threatening, but it is certainly a, a nuisance and has a bad stigma associated with it. Um, anal cancer, um, you know, is something that, that is life threatening. It looks completely different than anal, um, anal condyloma. These are just some examples of it. It usually looks like almost like an ulceration um, where you can see here, sometimes it's bulky and mimics a hemorrhoid. And probably the most common um, presentation of it that I see in the office when I diagnose it is a patient that has a lesion that looks something like this. That's why I put this picture on that they see their primary care doctor, the primary care doctor diagnoses as a hemorrhoid, they use preparation H and all the stuff over the counter, um, and it just doesn't go away and eventually gets referred to me for hemorrhoidic excision. And um, when you see it, if you see it a lot, you can just notice some subtle differences. One, it's it's either internal or external, but it's it's very friable. It doesn't look like a hemorrhoid where hemorrhoid is almost soft and it, it can um, sort of go in and out where this is, 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 is hard, it's friable. It looks like a bad actor or is a hemorrhoid. Really. And the other presentation is just ulcerations like you see here um, or here. Um, 
anal cancer is relatively rare. It encompasses about two and a half percent of all gastrointestinal cancers. Um, you know, there's about 8,300 8, new cases diagnosed annually. And this is driven by those high risk HPV strains 16 or 18 that can co uh, inhabitate with those that, um, that form the condyloma. Um, there is an increasing rate of anal cancer over the last 30 years. And this is pretty much this, each one of these lines is, is by age group. And you can see this is um, increasing pretty much in every age group um, that you can see, maybe not so much in the youngest, maybe this might be due to the vaccine, um, but you can see it's increasing in everyone. Um, there's a lot of reasons that this that is hypothesized that this is the case. Um, but like Dr. Blair had alluded to, the number of sexual partners has probably increased uh, smoking, um, receptive uh, anal sex and HIV um, as being the immunosuppressing aspect of that. Um, patients are obviously living you know, full lives with HIV, um, but they do have to take long-term HIV immunosuppression. And that comes with a consequence of potentially um, getting um, anal cancer from HPV. Um, clinical findings. Um, so some patients kind of have these vague uh, anal rectal complaints, a little bit of rectal bleeding, some pain, feeling a mass. Again, these are all very similar to having a hemorrhoid, um, but 20% have no symptoms um, at all. And it's, there's no specific symptom about this, but if you feel something down there, if it's hard, especially if it's painful, if it's bleeding, you definitely have to be evaluated. Um, and 50% of patients will have a history of condyloma. So if you have a history of condyloma and it's gone away, um, but you feel like a change down there, you should definitely uh, get evaluated as well. Um, again, the diagnosis, uh, very similar um, to what we do for condyloma. We do a similar exam in the office. Generally, if we think it is an anal cancer, uh, we'll do a biopsy of it either in the office or under some sedation in the operating room. So depending on where it is. And then once it's diagnosed, um, if it is diagnosed, then the next thing that the doctor will order is to see if it's spread um, or if it is confined to the anus. Um, and so you generally get a CT scan of the chest, abdomen, um, and pelvis to see if it's spread to the lymph nodes in your groin, your liver, your lung, um, or if it has, if it's just localized uh, to the anal area. Um, the treatment of um, anal cancer um, is different depending on where it is. So if it's in the anal canal, you're in some ways a little bit lucky. Um, it, well, I wouldn't say lucky, but you're, the treatment of the anal canal and in, in, where if it's in the skin around the anal canal um, is different. So if it's in the anal canal, um, the primary treatment is chemotherapy and radiation as a definitive treatment. Um, and so you'll get this for about six weeks. Um, it's every day, um, but there is about a 75% success rate um, of being completely cured. Um, so that's, that's actually you know quite good for, for a cancer. No surgery is involved it's in the, if it's in the anal canal, just chemotherapy and radiation. Um, if that fails, um, unfortunately, in those 25% of patients, we will need to do surgery to get rid of it. And that will require resecting this entire area and, and have giving the patient a permanent colostomy bag. But again, it's only one out of four, 75% success rate. Um, if it's in the skin around the anal canal, so if this is the anal canal there and the skin over here, then we can resect it if there is enough room to resect it and make sure that the anal canal is okay. And you can think of this almost as like a skin cancer. If you had like a basal cell on your arm, then we can resect, you know, you go to the dermatologist, they cut it off. Um, it's a similar thing when it's, when it's far away from the anal canal. If it's too close to the anal canal, then we do chemotherapy and radiation. Hopefully you're in that 75% and then it's cured. And if you're not in that 75%, they need more of a, an aggressive definitive surgery. Um, this is um, just a, a bit about screening. Um, uh, not dissimilar to screening for colon or rectal cancer. Um, which the guidelines are very regimented. You're either 45 or 50, you know, you get your colonoscopy. Um, if your parents have it at a young age, you get your colonoscopy 10 years younger. It's very kind of hard line uh, uh, 
definitions of when you should get screened. Um, screening for anal cancer is a big gray um, black box that we just don't really know what to do. Um, we do think that anal cancer becomes cancer by a normal sort of progression of precancerous lesions to cancer, but it's not always the case. And even some high grade precancerous lesions can spontaneously regress themselves. Um, so really screening um, only seems to be beneficial in patients who are really high risk. Um, and those are HIV positive patients, um, men who have sex with men, or patients who have um, anal intercourse, immunocompromised, like I said, um, patients uh, or women with a history of high grade cervical dysplasia, because we know that those strains can cause anal cancer, or patients with a history of warts, because we know that that uh, the warts and the anal strains that cause cancer uh, co, co migrate. Screening um, is usually done by an anal pap smear. Um, and then if that's positive, you'll usually be referred to a colorectal surgeon who can do that exam like I talked about either in the office or in the operating room. So um, just some take home points. Um, human papilloma virus is responsible for both anal condyloma and anal cancer. Anal condyloma can be treated usually first medically and then surgically. Um, and then high risk patients should be screened for anal cancer regularly. And if you remember that, and if you feel anything down there um, and you need to ha have us take a look, feel free to let us know. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at all. Thank you so much, Dr. Shogun, for that really important information. Um, you know, we, we think of, of HPV as being a cervical cancer uh, causing disease, which we know that it is, but it really is important that we keep in mind that it is not just cervical cancer and that there are um, these other cancers that are, are just as deadly that, can, um, that we can be affected by. Um, I do have a, a private question in the chat here asking about, um, is anal itching a, uh, a, a symptom of anal cancer? Yeah, sure. So a lot of people have anal itching. Um, so while anal itching could be a symptom of anal cancer, odds are that, um, odds are that it is not. Um, there's a lot of different reasons to have anal itching. It could be for something, you know, it could be hemorrhoids. It could be something called an anal fissure, which is just a little tear in the bottom. Uh, the most common reason is, serum, is something called puritis ani, which is just an itch of the bottom because stool leaks out a little bit. Um, and those are all very benign, you know, uh, treat with medical, not totally worrisome. So um, whomever asked that, I certainly don't want to freak you out. I mean, chances are it's nothing. That being said, if it's been going on for a while, it's probably worth having someone um, with a trained eye just to take a look at it, make sure it isn't anything that's worrisome. And then um, if it isn't something that's worrisome, that probably can be, you know, that person could probably help as well, um, work out the benign reasons and get a treatment plan for that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Dr. Uh, for Dr. Shogun? You can feel free to unmute yourself, drop it in the chat. If it's something private, you can message it to me privately and we can um, ask him anonymously. Um, I had a question similar to Gina's, you know, we know that anal cancer is, is pretty rare, but um, do you see, um, the, do you see a lot of the same sorts of disparities that we see um, in terms of uh, demography with anal cancer? We do. I mean, still, still to the day, the most common is is seeing it in in women because probably the association with HPV and, and the cervix. But um, we see, a, I, especially here at, at UFC, a big part of the population um, for anal cancer or condyloma, probably more condyloma is African-American um, homosexual men. Um, and that group of people for many, many different reasons, I think, um, don't have the same access to care. They don't wanna come. They might see something on their bottom and they would sort of ignore it. You're generally younger. Um, you know, I think it's hard to, you know, I remember when I was, you know, 20, I wasn't interested in going to the doctor, especially to have somebody look at their bottom. So. So we see it a lot um, here at UFC, and th that's the most common. I mean, it's very much our community that we treat is, is who we is who we see that. 
is who we see that in. And then the immunosuppression is a whole different, you know, kind of ball game. So I, HIV is a huge risk factor for, um, for HPV, either condyloma or anal cancer, as well as in the transplant population. So, so we certainly see it. And it is hard, especially because as younger um, men sometimes, um, it's hard to get them to, to follow up a little bit. So we, it might be huge gaps in, in their care where we, you know, we treat them with a medication, say, come back in two or three months. If it's not better, you know, I see them a year and a half later and, you know, it's, it's, it's much worse. So mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, some hurdles in, in that. Sure. Access to care, always, always a hurdle. Yep. Um, so there's a question here in the chat. It says, is there a recommended frequency for anal taps like there is for vaginal taps? Yeah, there, there, there isn't. The, the recommendations um, for screening for anal cancer are all over the place. And so what we generally do is somebody who has a high risk lesion, um, we'll do it every year for the first couple of years. And then we have a conversation. Um, surprisingly, um, it actually hasn't really shown that if we do intensive screening that we're preventing anal cancer that's completely different than if we do, you know, colonoscopy screening. It very clearly prevents colon cancer. But we don't really know the, the mechanism of a precancerous lesion to a, to a cancer lesion. So even folks that are high risk, if we screen them more often, um, it doesn't appear that we catch it um, in a way that we can do anything about. We might catch it a little bit earlier, but it still seems like the treatment is the same. So some doctors actually just go by their symptoms. Hey, let me know how you're feeling. If you feel anything down there, come and see me. Um, some people screen high-risk patients every six months. Most of us are sort of in the middle. If you have high-risk lesions, you should come back to the office every year, every year and a half or something like that until you sort of, until we sort of know it's stabilized. But to be honest, th those recommendations are based on data that is not very strong. Good to know. Uh, I have another question here. It says, what are the guidelines for vaccination uh, for high-risk groups? Yeah, same thing as, uh, as, as, as Dr. Blair said. You know, a lot of the folks that I see in the office um, are coming to me with symptoms. Um, and like she said, we don't think that the vaccine, you know, helps with symptoms. But if you're coming with symptoms, we usually recommend it. Um, and again, it's easy to get um, up to the age of 26. Um, a little bit harder to get between that and 40, and I think almost impossible to get it after that. But certainly, um, if you're a high-risk patient, um, I think the vaccine is has very little, you know, side effects, almost no risk. Um, if I, I would recommend it, and I recommend that to the to the patients that um, that I see, um, and they can just get it from their primary care doctor. Absolutely. Yet another reason to get the HPV vaccine. Exactly, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so I don't see any more questions here in the chat and I don't see any on our Facebook Live. So um, thank you again so much, uh, Dr. Shogun, for sharing your wisdom and your expertise with us today. It is so appreciated, appreciated and um, you know, we just thank you again for, for making time in what we know is a really busy day for you. Thank you again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it's my pleasure. And, and again, you know, it's kind of interesting, I'll just leave on this is that, we see in a colorectal clinic, we see patients with, with what I say, you know, butt problems all the time, but patients, you know, there's something different about that area that patients are very sensitive. So I see a patient with colorectal cancer and, and I'll see a patient in the hallway who works here and they'll high five me. Hey, that's my doctor. When it's a, when it's a, when it's a, when it's a butt problem, um, the, the patient isn't high fiving me in the hallway. Um, but just, just to, just to let everyone know, we're very, aware of the sensitivity of that in our clinic. Um, and of course, any patients, especially folks that we know that see us in the hospital, we keep everything very confidential and, and uh, we're happy to see if anything comes up. Thank you so much for, for adding that. Obviously, butt problems are very sensitive. So uh, exactly. I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that. Absolutely. And that's it. You guys take care. Thanks again, Dr. Shogun. Uh -huh.